اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سورۃ الصف آیا نمبر 1 ٹو 4 سورۃ الصف is a madni surah and it has 14 verses and about 900 huruf the surah as-saf what does as-saf mean rose this surah reiterates the same message that is common to all of the surahs of this juz which is supporting the deen aiding the deen of allah being of the hizbullah and at the same time maintaining a balance between deen as well as dunya being focused on the akhirah but at the same time not getting swayed by this dunya and you will notice that in these surahs many things are taught which are pertaining to supporting the deen working for the deen that first of all a person's priority should be allah and his messenger and the deen of allah and then a person must also be very sincere in his commitment and at the same time with sincerity there should also be unity As we learned earlier, that the example of the Ansar, the Muhajireen, it was given in Surah Al-Hashr, that how they were so united. And it wasn't just the Ansar, Muhajireen, but Allah also gives the example of الَّذِينَ تَبَوَّعُ الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانِ And later on, وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ Meaning the Tabi'een, the Taba Tabi'een, all of the later generations, that there must be unity amongst the Muslims. Because in order to support the deen, Yes, one should be committed himself. Yes, he should be sincere. But at the same time, there must also be unity. Because if people are not united, they cannot work for the same goal. And what is it that brings about unity in people? When they share the same goal. When they have the same goal. And remember, in order to stay united, you have to sacrifice a lot. You have to give up your ego. You have to You do things which you don't like. You have to accept other people's superiority. But all of this is necessary. Why? In order to support the deen of Allah. We learned earlier that وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Why? Accept the authority of the leader. That is necessary. And at the same time, believers should also be united themselves. Because without it, The work of the deen cannot go forward. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Sabbaha lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ardi. Whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth, it exalts Allah. Wa huwa al-aziz al-hakim. And he is the exalted in might, the wise. Surah al-Saf is also of the Musabbihat. And it begins with Sabbaha. That glorified is Allah. Exalted is Allah. Perfect is Allah. And everything in the heavens and the earth accepts His glory. Everything in the heavens and the earth glorifies Him. And He is Aziz and also Hakeem. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who have believed, Lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon, Why do you say that which you do not do? O you who have believed, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ لِمَا This is a combination of لِ and مَا لِ is of تعليل لام تعليل and مَا This مَا is actually abbreviated from مَا is of istifham So لِمَا together For what reason? Why? For what purpose? Why is it that تَقُولُونَ You say مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ What you do not do Meaning, why is there a discrepancy in your words and actions? Why is it that your words and actions are not coherent? Why is it that you say one thing and you do something else? If you think about it, having a discrepancy in words and actions, meaning a person says something else and does something else, what is this? A moral defect. This shows that a person is not honest. This shows that a person is being treacherous, that he is not trustworthy, he is not reliable. And if a person has such a moral defect, then that is a sign of moral decline. And when a people are suffering from moral decline, then they cannot work dedicatedly for a mission. So, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why is it that you say that which you do not do? Meaning, say that which you do. And do that which you say you will do. 
We learned that once Abdullah ibn Salam and some other companions were sitting together. And they said, If we only knew the dearest good actions to Allah, we would perform them. If we could only come to know what is it that Allah loves a lot. If we could come to know about those actions, we would do them. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed them about the dearest actions to him. How? We learn in this ayah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيهِ صَفَّةً كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانٌ مَرْصُوصٌ That Allah loves those people who fight in his way. How? Together, in rows, as if they are a firm structure. So in other words, Allah informed the people about what He likes. What is of the most dearest actions to Him and which is fighting in the way of Allah. Now, fighting in the way of Allah, is that something easy to do? It's not something easy to do. It's very difficult. And we see that the believers initially, when they were not allowed to fight, how badly they wanted to fight in the way. But later on when the command was given, there were some people who were hesitant. Some people who weren't willing. And this is mentioned many times in the Qur'an. For example, in Surah Muhammad, Ayah 20, we learn, وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَتْ سُورَةٌ فَإِذَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ مُحْكَمَةٌ وَذُكِرَ فِيهَا الْقِتَالُ رَأَيْتَ الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَيْكَ نَظَرَ الْمَغْشِيِّ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ Meaning they didn't want to fight. Similarly in Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 77, we learn, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ قِيلَ لَهُمْ كُفُّوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ فَلَمَّا كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقِتَالُ إِذَا فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ يَخْشَوْنَ النَّاسَ كَخَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ أَوْ أَشَدَّ خَشْيَةِ وَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا لِمَا كَتَبْتَ عَلَيْنَا الْقِتَالِ لَوْ لَا أَخَرْتَنَا إِلَى أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ So the believers, they initially requested, this is what they desired, this is what they wanted, to fight in the way of Allah. And they wanted to do those actions which please Allah. But when they were told, this is what you have to do, they weren't exactly ready. They were hesitant. They stayed back, some of them. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, لِمَ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَرُ Now although behind the revelation of this ayah is a particular incident, which is the one that I just mentioned to you, of those companions who were expressing their desire to know of that which Allah likes. However, remember that in this is a lesson for everyone. In this is a lesson for all believers. For all of us. We see that sometimes we're very enthusiastic about something. We're very emotional. And out of that enthusiasm, out of that love, out of that emotion, we make great claims. We make big commitments. And we say, tell us what to do and we'll do it. Give us anything, we'll do it. Any work you give me, I'll do it. But when actually the work is given, then we say, no, I think I'm too busy. No, I don't think this suits me. No, I think I'm worth more. It happens sometimes. That out of enthusiasm, we say big things, we make great claims, but when the time to act comes, then what happens? Our eagerness is not there anymore. It's as though it has left us. And we find it very difficult to do those actions. So over here Allah says, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why do you say that which you do not do? Why did you say you will do it and when the time comes to do it, you're not doing it? Because this attitude does not suit the believers. It does not suit a sincere believer. Who is a sincere believer? That there is no discrepancy in his words and actions. Whatever he says, he does it. If he makes a commitment, he fulfills it. If he makes a promise, he fulfills it. And this promise could be with people and it could also be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learn in Surah Al-Ahzab, Ayah 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the true believers as what? مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُوا اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ Among the believers are men true to what they promised Allah. Among the believers are those men who are true to the promise that they made with Allah. They made promises with Allah and they actually fulfilled them. They promised that they would spend in His way and when the time came, they actually spent in His way. They promised 
that they would fight in his way. And when the time came, they actually did that. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ Among them is he who has fulfilled his vow. His vow, meaning among them is he who has even given up his life for the sake of Allah, meaning he has been martyred. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا And there are others who are still awaiting. Who are still waiting for their promise to be fulfilled. Meaning it's not that they have changed their mind. No, they're still committed. وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا And they did not alter the terms of their commitment by any alteration. So the true believers are who? When they make a promise with Allah, when they make a commitment, what do they do? They fulfill it. They don't turn away. They don't break their promise. So, لِمَ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Because this does not suit you. This does not suit a true believer. Someone who claims to love Allah, whatever he says to Allah, he will do it. So why is this being said over here? That don't be like this, don't have this kind of attitude. لِمَ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Great is hatred in the sight of Allah. أَن تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ That you say what you do not do. كَبُرَ It's very great. It's very serious. It's very heavy. It's major. What is major? مَقْتًا In anger, in aversion, in hatred. What is very great in hatred? In the Allah, in the sight of Allah? أَن تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ That you say that which you do not do. Meaning, if you say something that you're going to do it and later on you don't do, who are you upsetting? Who are you making extremely angry with you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you say things and you don't do them, this is greatly loathsome in the sight of Allah. Greatly hated in the sight of Allah. كَبُرَ مَقْتَنَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَن تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ now remember that لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ أَن تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ This can take many shapes and forms. First of all, it is that a person says something, he makes a commitment, but then later he does not fulfill it. He says he will do something, he makes a promise, but then he doesn't do it. In Surah Maryam, Ayah 54, we learn about Ismail alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ إِسْمَعِيلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ الصَّادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّةِ Ismail alayhi salam, how was he? صادق الوعد True to his promise. Any promises that he made, he fulfilled them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises Ismail alayhi salam that when he said he will do something, he did it. And what's the evidence of that? When his father asked him, that what do you say? This is a dream that I had. What did he say? Ya abati, if Allah took do whatever you have been instructed. And it wasn't that at that time he became very enthusiastic and, you know, he had an iman rush and he said, yes, yes, father, go ahead, sacrifice me, slaughter me. And when the time to slaughter came, he hid, he ran away. No, he was there. Both of them submitted. Sadiq al Ward. Ibrahim alayhi salam. How was he? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him with some kalimat, فَأَتَمَّهُنْ He completed them, he perfected them. Meaning everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed him to do, Ibrahim alayhi salam did it. Even if it was extremely, extremely difficult and very painful, but he did it. Why? Because Allah had said to him, Aslim, and he had said, Aslam to li Rabbil Alameen. So when he said, Aslam to li Rabbil Alameen, it's a very beautiful statement. However, he fulfilled it. So, لِمَ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ What does it mean, first of all? That a person says something, makes a commitment, says he will do something, but then he doesn't do it. This is something that is greatly hated by Allah. What does Allah like? That when you say you're going to do something, you actually do it. In Surah Al-Isra, Ayah 34, we learn, وَأَوْفُوا بِالْعَهْدِ إِنَّ الْعَهْدَ كَانَ مَسْؤُولًا And fulfill every commitment. Indeed, the commitment is ever that about which one will be questioned. And remember that commitments, they can be of two types. One are those that we make with people. 
and the other are those that we make with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His deen. So when it comes to those commitments that we make with people, promises that we make with them, what should we do? We should fulfill them. And when it comes to the promises, the commitments that we make with the deen of Allah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even those, what should we do? We should fulfill them. Now give me some examples of promises that we make with people, commitments that we make with people. Like for example, an appointment. If you have to cancel it, cancel it. But don't just not show up. Because when you don't show up, you hurt many people. I went to a clinic recently and it was said when you miss an appointment, it hurts three people. You, that you didn't get to see the doctor. Secondly, the doctor himself. Why? Why do you think so? Because it's a waste of their time. And thirdly, another patient who could have taken your time. But you took that time. It was reserved for you. That's why nobody else could take it. So it hurts three people. What other promises? Commitments that we make with people that we must fulfill? Like for example, we say to children, I'll give this to you. I'll give that to you. That when you've said that you're going to do it, when you've said that you're going to give it, then give it. Remember that incident where a woman called her child and she said she will give him something? And the Prophet ﷺ asked her, that you're going to give it or not? Something like that. So what does that hadith show to us? That even with children, whatever promises we make, we must fulfill them. Similarly, what other commitments do we make with people? Like for example, we will help them, we will support them. We will come at a certain time and help them out with particular work that they're doing. So, any commitment that is made with people, what is our responsibility that we must? Okay. Now, commitments with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the deen of Allah, what does that include? For example, the five pillars. When a person becomes a Muslim, he agrees to do certain things. So, لِمَ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why do you say that you're a Muslim and you don't be a Muslim? What else? Anything to do with serving the deen of Allah, like that, for example, a person says that they will take a particular course, they will be regular, they will do the assignments, they will take the tests, they will be regular, they will come on time, leave on time, not early, not late. So, this is what? A commitment. And that commitment must also be fulfilled. And if a person does not fulfill that, then this is very hateful. In whose sight? In the sight of Allah. Yes, other people, they won't like you. Fine. Forget about other people. But imagine even Allah does not like it. And look at the word. Maqtan. What is maqt? Hatred. Aversion. When you hate what the other is doing, you don't like it at all. You know what else the word maqt has been used for in the Quran? Marrying who? The ex-wife of the father. Marrying her is what? Maqtan. It's fahsha and also maqtan, something that Allah hates. So imagine, if a person says he will do something and he doesn't do it, he's doing something that is extremely disliked by Allah. Extremely disliked. What other falls in this commitment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, promise with Allah? Like for example, when a person is in a difficulty, he says, Oh Allah, you allow this to happen, make this happen, and I will do such and such. Hmm? If only I could become better. If only my health would improve, if only I would find the answer to this question, if only I could get this work done, I will do such and such. I will give this much sadaqah. I will spend this much time doing such and such. But when it actually happens, then we don't fulfill the promises. So, كَبُرَ مَقْتَنَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُ What else? Anything that a person does for the deen, he starts it, and then he stops. He starts, but then he leaves it halfway. He doesn't complete it. Remember the description of the Sahaba? Sadaqu ma Allah They were truthful to the promise they made with Allah. That when they said they were going to do something, they did it. No matter how difficult it was. What is it that stops us from Doing that which we said we will do. Difficulties, challenges. 
But remember that difficulties and challenges are a part of life. Some things, they are in your control. Other things, they are beyond your control. Some things, you are able to do, even when life becomes difficult. And other things, you're not able to do, because of the time that they demand, because of the work that is required, you're not able to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about the circumstances that you're in. However, you also know what your ability is. Once you've said you're going to do something, once you've made a commitment, then don't leave halfway through. Complete it. Fulfill it. Because لِمَ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Allah does not like this behavior. You know, sometimes it happens that a person starts doing something good and, you know, halfway he becomes unwell, he becomes sick, or he gets busy somewhere, or something happens, some guests come over. That doesn't mean you leave everything. You leave everything. And you just attend to that main thing that has come in your life and has become your main focus. No. You know, like, my mother, she always used to tell me, when my son was born, because I was still teaching at that time, she said to me that, look, eating, drinking, going out, spending time with the family, doesn't it continue when a child is born? Doesn't it continue? Do you stop eating? Do you stop sleeping? Do you stop going to parties? No. Then why is it that when a child is born, we say, I cannot do this work anymore. I cannot study anymore. I cannot teach anymore. I cannot do this anymore. Yes, it becomes difficult. But you can always adjust it in your life. You can always make adjustments. You can always make changes. You have to sacrifice for some time. You have to really take it hard on yourself for some time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the ability. Just think about it. Your life doesn't stop otherwise. So why is it that we make the deen stop in our lives? That's not fair. It's not right. So, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ I see some mothers who, they're coming to class, and I don't know how to do it. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give barakah in their time and their energy and their physical strength that taking one child to the toilet, taking another child to the toilet, taking another child for lunch break, and they're running back and forth and yet they're smiling. Smiling. This is a big thing. Because when a person has made a commitment with Allah, and remember this is a commitment with Allah, not with other people. You're doing it for your own benefit. So when you are doing it for your own benefit to gain reward from Allah, then you will fulfill the commitment no matter how difficult it becomes, no matter how challenging it becomes. So, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ When you've made a commitment with Allah, fulfill it. Allah does not like it that you go against your word. Then another way that this happens is that a person advises others, he tells others to do good or to not do something bad, but he himself does different things. Meaning he advises others, tells others what he himself does not do. لِمَا تَقُولُونَ Why do you instruct مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ What you don't do yourselves? Because a person must practice what he preaches. If a person is just telling other people and not doing good himself, then this is what? Hypocrisy. And this is bringing about the wrath of Allah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 44, we learn about the Yahud. أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنْفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ You order righteousness of the people, you tell people to do good, and you forget yourselves while you read the scripture yourself. It's not that you're ignorant, you know. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Then do not reason. Will you not use your mind? Shu'ayb a.s., the Prophet of Allah, he said to his people while conveying the message to them, in Surah Hud, Ayah 88, we learn, وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُخَالِفَكُمْ إِلَى مَا أَنْهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ إِنْ أُرِيدُ إِلَّا الْإِصْلَاحِ And I do not intend to differ from you in that which I have forbidden you. Meaning, what I forbid you from, I stay away from that as well. It's not that I'm telling you not to do something, and I'm doing it myself. No. وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُخَالِفَكُمْ إِلَى مَا أَنْهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ in uridu illa al-islah. Because this is treachery. This is deception. This is wrong. That a person is advising other people. And when it comes to his own actions, they're completely different. 
The Prophet ﷺ, he said, A man will be brought on the day of resurrection and thrown into the hellfire so that his intestines will come out and he will go around like a donkey goes around a millstone. Like an animal goes around a millstone, just going round and round in circles. This is how this man will be going around in a hellfire. The people of Hellfire will gather around him, surprised, and they will say, Oh, so and so, what is wrong with you? Didn't you used to order us to do good and forbid us to do bad? You were the one telling us to do good and you were the one forbidding us from doing evil. And he will reply, Yes, I used to order you to do good, but I did not do it myself. And I used to forbid you to doing bad, but I used to do it myself. This is reported in Bukhari. Such a severe punishment. Severe punishment because كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنَّ اللَّهِ أَن تَقُولُ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ You're preaching, instructing, but you're not doing it yourself. Allah hates this as well. Then another way that a person could do this, contradiction in his words and actions, is that a person says he has done something, Whereas in fact he has not done it. So lima taquluna? Why do you say that you have done such and such? Whereas ma you have not done it. Why is it that a person would say he has done certain good deeds or he has accomplished certain things, whereas in reality he hasn't done anything of that sort? Like for example, I used to work there and I have this degree and I used to live in that country, and I used to make that much money, and I've studied such and such, whereas in fact he hasn't done anything like that. Why would a person do that? To impress other people, to show up, to gain their praise. Lying. This is also something that is hated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a sign of what? Hypocrisy. In Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 188, we learn about the munafiqeen, وَيُحِبُّونَ أَن يُحْمَدُوا بِمَا لَمْ يَفْعَلُوا They love to be praised for what they have not done. They haven't actually done it, but they still want to be praised for it. So Allah does not like this behavior either. What Allah likes is truthfulness. What Allah likes is honesty. What Allah likes is fulfilling the commitment. Not that a person makes promises, but he breaks them. That a person says one thing and he does something else. No. This is a behavior that Allah does not like. Disloyalty, untrustworthiness is a trait that cannot be found in a believer. Remember that. This is a trait that is found in who? In a munafiq, in a hypocrite. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ayatul munafiqi thalas. There are three signs for a hypocrite. What are they? إِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ When he makes a promise, he breaks it. وَإِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبَ When he speaks, he lies. وَإِذَا تُمِنَ خَانَ And when he is entrusted, he betrays. Because in all of these things, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ He makes a promise, he says he will do it, but then he breaks it. Then, when he speaks, he lies. He says he has done something, whereas in reality he hasn't done it. When he's given an amana, he said, yes, he will take care of it. But then he doesn't take care of it. لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ In another hadith we learn, there are three signs of a hypocrite. Even if he observed fast and prayed and asserted that he was a Muslim. These three signs, same signs, but in that hadith is additional, that وَإِن صَامَ وَصَلَّ وَزَعْمَ أَنَّهُ مُسْلِمُ Even if that person prays salah, he fasts in the month of Ramadan, and he thinks that he is a Muslim, but in fact, who is he? A munafiq. That لِمَ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ If you think about it, if there is a discrepancy in the words and actions of a person, they are not coherent, or a person breaks his promises, does not fulfill the commitments, then what's the harm? What's the harm? What's the loss? There is no loss? Okay, there's no loss, then do it. What's the loss? It affects other people. How? In many ways. That first of all, it promotes the culture of lying. It promotes the culture of breaking promises. It promotes the culture of not fulfilling commitments. 
doesn't it? Tell me, for example, if I say that no, I'm not going to continue teaching the course, for example, are you going to continue completing the course? Probably not. If one person says, I'm not going to come, doesn't it give confidence to other people as well that they should not show up either? And if one person fulfills his commitment, then other people are also encouraged. So the harm is that it affects other people. It promotes the culture of lying. It promotes the culture of breaking promises, not fulfilling your commitments. The second point of Lima Tukurun Amarat of Arlun, that a person preaches what he does not practice himself. So for example, a person is telling other people about something good or stopping them from bad, but he recognizes that he doesn't do it fully himself, that his actions are different, and he recognizes that, he accepts that, but still he is advising other people. Like for example, a father tells his son don't smoke, but he realizes that he smokes himself. But he knows that smoking is bad. It's wrong. But does he have the right to tell his son or not? What's the answer? Yes, but he must also strive to stop himself. Because until he does not stop himself, his advice is not going to have any effect. I heard somewhere, I don't remember which scholar exactly it was, that he said, whenever I find a weakness in me, I start preaching about that. I start teaching about that. Because when I start teaching about that, then what happens? It opens up my eyes. It tells me that this is wrong, and I hate that wrong action even more, or I like that good action even more. And as a result, it becomes a part of me. So sometimes it helps you. Because remember, no person is perfect. You tell other people, for example, backbiting is wrong, and then you are sitting with someone and you realize, I just did that. You're telling children, don't lie. You're telling children, don't behave like this. Be gentle. And then what happens? Your children remind you, be gentle. No person is perfect. However, a person should always have this understanding that I need to improve. And he should have that sincerity, that ikhlas. And he should strive his best to do good, to stay away from wrong. Now, going back to the loss of, the harm of contradiction between word and action. First is that people get affected. How? That you're promoting the culture of contradiction in word and action. Another effect is that other people suffer. Other people suffer. You make a promise with someone, you don't fulfill it. You think they're not going to suffer anything. Of course they will. Similarly, for example, if there is a store and it says open from 9 to 5. You go there at 9.05, 5 minutes past 9 o'clock, it's still closed. Is it going to harm you? Of course. It's taking away from your time. And like this, a person also loses the trust of others. You break a commitment once, you break a promise another time. The third time, people are not going to trust you. If you go to a store, it says we'll be open at 9. And it's 10 minutes past 9, half an hour past 9, you're waiting. One day it's closed, it opens up an hour late. Another day again, the same thing happens. You're not going to go there again. You're not going to recommend that place to anyone else. So this is the harm, that a person becomes untrustworthy, unreliable in the sight of people. But the worst is that a person earns Allah's wrath. Because Allah says, كَبُرَ مَقْتَنَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُ Allah hates it. It's greatly disliked by him that you say that which you do not do. If a person, you know, makes a commitment and he does not fulfill it, he starts something, but he does not complete it, then what message is he giving out to other people? That this work is not really that important. It's not really that important. It's okay. There are other things that are more important, other things that are more necessary. So remember, whenever you start a good action, whenever you start a good deed, this is like a commitment that you're making with who? With your Lord. And once you've made that commitment, then fulfill it. Fulfill it. Remember, in Surah Al-Nur, we learned about older women. That when they have reached a particular age of being qawa'id, it's okay for them that they remove their outer garments, meaning their jilbab, 
they can take it off because it's difficult for them, inconvenient for them. But if they keep it on, it's better for them. Why? Because once you've started a good deed, then you should continue with it for the rest of your life. Because what kind of actions does Allah like? Those actions which are consistent even if they're small. So consistency is that which Allah likes to see in us. Not inconsistency. No matter what kind of inconsistency it may be. And this is something that we should be careful about in matters of deen as well as matters of dunya. We see that this leads to disunity. This leads to mistrust. That if a person is not fulfilling his promise, can you trust them? No. If a person says he will do something but they don't fulfill their commitment, can you work with them? No, you cannot work with them. So the key to unity, the key to being strong is what? Fulfilling your commitments, being true to your promises. كَبُوَ مَقْتَنَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ صَفَّا كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانٌ مَرْصُوصٌ Allah loves those people who fight in His cause in a row as if they are a single structure joined firmly. First Allah tells us about what He does not like. Then He tells us about what He likes. What is it that He likes? Who is it that He likes? الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ صَفَّا Those who fight in His way in rows, making straight rows with discipline, organization. كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانُ مَرْصُوصٌ As if they are a single structure that is joined firmly. Bunyan is structure, building. And مَرْصُوصٌ That which is solidified. That which is pressed together. مَرْصُوصٌ is from the root letters رَاصَاتْ صَاتْ صَاتْ And رَص is to construct, to build a structure that is very solid very firm in itself, and then on top, you pour some kind of material in order to solidify it, so that no gaps, no rifts remain inside. Remember the wall that Zulqarnain built? What did he say? Atuni Zubar al-Hadid. He filled the gap with the pieces of iron. And then he said, Qalan Fuhu, blow the bellows. And then, Ufriq alayhi qitra. Then he poured on top molten copper. Why? Because when that is poured on top, then any gaps, any rifts, whatever, they're completely sealed together. So then the structure, the wall, it becomes firmly compacted together. There are no cracks, no breaks in the middle. And then it's also firm in its place, that you can't move it. So Bunyan Marsus gives us two meanings. First of all, a solid structure in which there are no gaps, no cracks, no weaknesses inside, meaning united. And secondly, a structure that is firm in its place. A structure that does not move. Why? Because its parts are cemented with one another. So these are the kind of believers that Allah likes. Those who are together. Those who are not disunited from inside. No, they are together. And then they are firm. Because bunyan marsus is what? A structure that is firm in its place. You can't move it. So once they've made a commitment, once they've started something, they're not going to stop until they finish it. So who does Allah like? Two characteristics are mentioned over here. First of all, united from within. And secondly, fully committed. Fully committed. This is what Allah likes. كَأَنَّهُمْ bunyan marsus. You see, one is just a crowd of people. And another is an organized group. A crowd of people, how do they look? Messy, unimpressive, disorganized. And on the other hand, an organized group, people who are in rows, in files, each person at his place, each person doing his work, how do they look? Very impressive. How is their work? Very good. There's quality in their work. Their work is also very productive because they're not disorganized. When people are praying together in straight rows, then what happens? There is more khushu. Otherwise, you're constantly thinking, oh, sister, please move your foot here. Please stand closer to me. You cannot have khushu then. So what is it that enables you to work properly? Focused. It's unity. It's standing together. This is what Allah likes.
You see, if a wall is cracked, can you put something on it? Can you put a ceiling on it? Can you put a roof on it? No. Only when a wall is firm and strong, plastered together, consolidated, then you can put something on top of it. Then it can serve as a foundation. So similarly, only when believers are united, then can they carry a heavy responsibility. Then can they accomplish something. But if they're cracked from everywhere, if they're broken apart from everywhere, then will they be able to do anything? They will not be able to do anything at all. So, over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that what He likes in believers is unity and steadfastness. Because these are two things that lead to success. Unity and steadfastness. And unity means discipline, organization. And we see that this quality, the Sahaba radhiallahu anhum, they had organization, unity. And unity, for its sake, sometimes you have to sacrifice a lot. Like for example, in order to make a straight line, do you have to stand uncomfortably sometimes? Do you have to? Yes, you do. In order to make straight lines anywhere, you have to sacrifice. But if you say, no, no, I'm too comfortable in my spot. Why should I move? She should move. I'm not going to move, she should move. Then that's not going to lead to unity. So sometimes for the sake of unity, what do you have to do? Sacrifice. You have to give up your ego. We see that the Sahaba, when the Prophet ﷺ sent them for the Battle of Mu'tah in the 8th year of Hijrah, the Battle of Mu'tah, he appointed three leaders. Zayd ibn Haritha, radiallahu anhu, Ja'far, radiallahu anhu, and then thirdly, Abdullah ibn Rawaha. And what did he say? That if Zayd is killed then, Ja'far becomes a leader. If he is killed then, Abdullah ibn Rawaha should become the leader. And we learned that Ja'far of the Ra'ahu initially he said, I'm not going to accept Zayd as a leader above me. Why? Zayd of the Ra'ahu was younger. He was much older. And remember that he had come from in Abyssinia, he was a leader. Remember Ja'far of the Ra'ahu? He was the leader of the Muslims in Abyssinia. He spoke for them. Now imagine he had to accept somebody else's leadership. Initially he said no. But the Prophet ﷺ advised him and he accepted. He accepted and he went. And in the battle he was martyred. Now imagine if he said, no, I'm not going. You don't make me the big leader. I'm not going. If he didn't go, would he be rewarded with martyrdom at that time? No. So what do we see? That sometimes for the sake of unity, for the sake of greater good, you have to give up your ego as well. You have to sacrifice. You have to move. You have to provide space to the other. You have to do that which is more difficult. But if a person remembers this is what Allah likes, then it becomes easy. Because in Allah يُحِبُّ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِهِ صَفًّا كَأَنَّهُمْ بِنِيَانِ مَحْصُوصٍ Sometimes we underestimate ourselves. We don't realize the potential that we have. And we get stuck because of these little, little things. Oh, why is she here? Why are they here? But remember, for the sake of unity, just give up your ego. For the sake of unity, do what you're supposed to do. Because sometimes when we're working together in an organization, it's quite possible a decision is made and we don't like it. We find it hard. But for the sake of staying together, for the sake of steadfastness, for the sake of doing the work, accept it. And there is khair in that, inshallah.